Welcome to My Life Chassidus Applied, episode 413, a special Tisha B'Av Nitcha, conclusion of Tisha B'Av edition. We are literally at the end of the saddest day of the year, the 9th of Av. This year it's the 10th of Av, because since Shabbos was yesterday, the 9th of Av was on Shabbos. We then don't fast, so the fast if Mashiach doesn't come, is pushed off to the 10th of all, which is now. So we will focus on that central theme as well as other related themes. But I'd like to begin by first saying that this uh, program is dedicated in merit of Baruch ben Yamin ben Menuch Elena and Miriam bas Sara Altes, Yukusil ben Leir Rachel and Rachel bas Liba Farkash, dedicated by Pinchas Todes ben Miriam and Sarah bas Rachel Altes. So the first question has to be answered, why are we doing a program when it's such a sad day? And the answer is very straightforward. I take my cue from our Rebbe. When the year Tavshin Nun Aleph, we're talking about literally, um, uh, we're talking about 29 years ago, was also a Tisha B'Av Nitcha. The year was 1991. And the Tisha B'Av was on Shabbos. And though the Rebbe fabrained on that Shabbos, which he always did when it was Tisha B'Av, Shabbos, Chazayin, but what he did then was this thing he never did before. He spoke on the 10th of Av, 8.35 p.m. The fast was over approximately 9, if I recall correctly. The Rebbe came down, 8.35 p.m., and uh, they, they, uh, the Rebbe spoke a talk, gave a talk, and then gave out dollars. They dove in Mayriv. And then the Rebbe began the song of his father, of Levi Yitzchak. So this was on Tisha B'av, the end of Tisha B'av. Now, when you understand the theme of what the Rebbe spoke about, and you understand also that Tisha B'av, even though we're not supposed to learn Teda, but it says that learning things that are around Tisha B'av, whether it's Gemara Moed Katan, or it's Eicha Rabba, the Medrash and Eicha on the Book of Lamentations, is allowed. And especially when you talk about the actual theme of Tisha B'av, that's what allows us to be able to speak. And that's what we're focusing on here. And the key thing the Rebbe said, I'll just sum up, it's worthwhile reading and learning that sikha, that talk. It's printed in Sefer HaSichas Tovshin and Aleph, Volume 2. And it's a sikha that combines the Fabrengen of Shabbos, Tisha B'Av, Shabbos, Dvorim, Chazayin, plus what the Rebbe said on Sunday, as well as, as he spoke also the other days that came afterwards. So it's all edited by the Rebbe and printed, very powerful sikha. The bottom line is that Tisha B'av, though it's the saddest day of the year, the day when we uh, remember and commemorate and relive the tragic events, the five events as the Mishnah spells out that happened on this day, and of course, namely the destruction of the Temple. But nothing in Judaism, nothing in Torah, nothing in existence that God put into this world and God created everything is just a dead end. It's just darkness as an end in itself. Everything has deeper power and deeper light. And that's why we say, that these days will be transformed, the prophet says, and the Rambam brings it in halacha, the end of the laws of tinyness of fasting, that these days will be transformed, not just eliminated, transformed to days of celebration and holidays. And the Medr says that Tisha B'Av will be the greatest holiday. Because within even the greatest darkness lies tremendous power and tremendous holiness. However, when it's a fast day, what you see is the outer expression that we need to remember and mourn and grieve over that which we lost. And the intention, however, is that it should elicit from us a yearning and a longing to correct what has to be corrected so we can have the gu'ul and the rebuilding of the base of Midas. But when Tisha B'Av comes out on Shabbos, it's not just you push it off. Shabbos reveals only the positive part of Tisha B'av. So we have everything that Tisha B'av has, but only the positive parts. The Eis Ratzin, that it's an auspicious time. The birth of Mashiach, as the Medrash and the Yerushalmi say. Mashiach was born Tisha B'av in the afternoon. So on a Shabbos, because Shabbos is more powerful than the fast, that doesn't mean you have nothing of Tisha B'av. You have everything of Tisha B'av. Actually, you have the primary parts of it. And you actually celebrate it through meal, through a meal. The Rebbe compared it to Yom Kippur. It says in the Gemara 
that uh, when a person on, on Yom Kippur is supposed to fast, but the mitzvah is on Erev Yom Kippur, the ninth of Tishrei, the ninth, you're supposed to eat, as a matter of fact, supposed to eat double meal. And the Gemara says, Kol everyone who eats a meal on the ninth of Tishrei is as if considered as if they fasted the ninth and the tenth. So the Rebbe has compared that, he said the same thing here. When you eat the meal on Shabbos Tisha B'Av, which is a mitzvah to eat, it's to celebrate, to enjoy Shabbos, Tainuk Shabbos, Enuk Shabbos. So what you have is the qualities of the ninth of Av plus the qualities of the tenth of Av. Now if Mashiach would have come, then the tenth of Av would have been not a fast day, it would have been completely transformed in a revealed way. Since Mashiach didn't come, sadly. So therefore, we still have to remember the, the mourning and the grieving part. But it's critical to know this, because this is the ultimate lesson of it all. That even when you grieve over something, even when you're saddened by something, it's not a sadness as an end in itself. That's part of the healing. It would be like someone who's been hurt and says, I believe in God, I trust God, I don't need to cry, I don't need to feel anything. That's not healthy. That would be like someone having an infection, God forbid, and say, I'm going to ignore it, it'll just go away, I believe that God will heal it. No, you have to nip it in the bud, you have to be aware, have the cure of something is awareness. Awareness of a problem is have the cure. And therefore, without that, you're not going to do anything about it. That's why the Rambam writes, the basis of fasting, not just to fast because something happens sad, it's because to be aware, introspective. He says when a catastrophe strikes a community, or an individual for that matter, it'd be cruel, achzorius, and insensitive to say, oh, Mikra it just happened. Let's move on. The way to approach it is to say, no, it happened. I'm aware of it. What am I going to do about it? What can I do to repair the rifts, to repair the cracks and the schisms so we should be able to rebuild the Beis Amikdash? So if you look at it that way, sadness is one half of the coin. It's one half of the journey. The half of awareness, remorse, sensitivity. Then, the next step is once you have that, then you do whatever you can to repair and correct and to reverse the process that led to Tisha B'av. What led to the second destruction of the temple? The destruction of the second temple? Sinas chinam, baseless hatred. When we separate ourselves from one another, when there's divisiveness, the blessings cannot dwell. Unity is the keli. And we end the Mishnah. God did not find a blessing except except shalom, peace. And the reasoning is very simple. When a father wants to bless his children and his children are fighting with each other, he doesn't even want to be present there, let alone bless them. But when they're united, so that draws the nachas, the joy, this pleasure, the, the, the simcha of the father. And barcheinu avinu kolonu ke'echad. Our father blesses us kolonu ke'echad when we stand together. So there's two parts to Tisha B'Av. When it's Shabbos Tisha B'Av, we only have the first, the positive element. And we actually celebrate through meals and through celebration. And on Sunday, if Mashiach hasn't come, we also have to honor the first half, which is the sad part. But even then, we also know that Mashiach was born in the afternoon. When the fires were at their highest. Because the negative is only to lead to a greater positive. So when there is a betrayal or any other type of trauma or any other loss and setback, we have to always see it as an opportunity to be a catalyst, a springboard to catapult us to greater heights. And that's a very specific lesson to all of us no matter what we go through in life. Whether it's a very tragic event and God should protect us from anything like that or it's even a smaller setback or a smaller... Uh, a twist and turn or downturn in our lives that is part of a journey and the journey continues and the crying the ace lift is the time when we cry is like Hazed and Bedima we sow with tears but then we will reap in joy so the tears are really water they are like the raindrops the teardrops that plant the seeds for tremendous amount of growth. And that's why sadness that demoralizes and breaks a person, 
That's always coming from a negative place. The Alter Rebbe says that already in Tanya. Like the difference between depression and sadness. Atzvus and But a sadness that motivates you, that stimulates, that inspires you, that's a sadness that's part of a bigger picture. So this year we see this very pronounced. And that talk that the Rebbe delivered 29 years ago, and exactly the same kvias, the same schedule, teaches us this tremendous lesson. So what better way to honor it as we come to the conclusion of Tisha B'Av, where we had the Shabbos yesterday, all the positive side of it. We had already the sadness today, but we've also had the birth of Mashiach, the hope, and this leads to the Shiva de Nechemta, the beginning of the seven weeks of comforting and consolation. Which again, isn't just comfort as in, okay, you felt sad, I'll comfort you. It's a healing process. It's a seven-week healing process which goes right into what? Rosh Hashanah. And then Yom Kippur and the Tesukas and Tesim Chastera and all the great joy. All born from Tisha B'av, from the month of Av. As the Shalom, Sayyid and Chassidus, by the Samach Tzedek. Shalom says that the, ma- the mazel for the month of Av is Aryeh. That's not the Shalom, that's the Gemara that says that. Arye Leo, Lion. Arye is made up of four letters, and it's an acronym. Arye Lion. There's the negative lion referring to Nebuchadnezzar that destroyed the lion, the Beis Amigdash, in the month of the lion. Al Manas says the Madrash Al Kuchmeni, that the lion, God, Arye Shoig, Mila Yira, will come and rebuild the lion in the month of the lion. So Arye Rosh Tevis, what does it give birth to? El Rosh Hashanah Yim Kippur Hishayin Rab. Those great days are all born out of this dark moments, which tells you everything you need to know about the process. The story is not over. So as we go from Tisha B'av and 10th of Av, the 10th is already a complete day, 10. It leads us into the 15th of Av, which we'll talk about more in this program. Equating again to Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur remembers the healing. And the salach de kidverech and the forgiveness. And the reconciliation after the betrayal of the building of the golden calf on the 17th of, on the on 39 days after they received the Torah. And then Mesha bro- broke the tablets on the 17th of Tammuz, which is the beginning of the three weeks. Tisha B'av is the conclusion of that sad period. That leads into El and ultimately to Yom Kippur, 40 days after Rosh which is the healing of that. Similar to B'av is the healing of the moon that was wounded. The Begama Levana, the wound that injured and scarred Levana Malchus, that was wounded during Tisha B'av. Nine, not ten, lacking Malchus, the dignity, the connection, the bridge between the divine and earth, which is the Beis Amid, the Shara Shemaim, the gate to heaven. That was all compromised. And to Ba'av, like Yom Kippur, and that's why there's, they, they're equated to one another, is the healing that comes after such a loss. So it's all a story, all a narrative leading to greater healing and greater growth. It's a lesson both on a macrocosmic level for the collective and a lesson for each one of us individually that no matter what you go through life, remember the story. It's a bigger story. Sometimes hard to see. Like the, the famous example of the Baal Shem Tov, of this Shvindel trap. In Yiddish, a spiral staircase is called Shvindel trap. What's swindle trap? It means a swindling staircase. Why? Because it swindles you into thinking that you're not making any progress. A regular staircase, you climb up, it may be a long staircase, but you see the destination. Or even if you don't, you see directly, you're getting closer. In a spiral staircase, which is, to, it, which is a much, it's a staircase to save space, it twists, you have to turn around 180 degrees. Your back has to be turned to the destination quite a few times until you get to the top. And right before you reach the zenith, the top, the apex, you need to turn around completely and your back is facing and you can convince yourself, maybe I haven't reached and maybe I haven't made any progress. It swindles us into thinking that we haven't made progress. Says the Baal Tov, no, right before the highest point, you won't see it, but you've been making many, much progress. And the progress is that ultimately we reach the top, which is the Geula. If you keep that in mind, your life is like a, swind- a swindling staircase, a spiral staircase. It can help us get through the most difficult times. That doesn't make them less difficult necessarily. It's still painful. 
but it makes it less difficult because you know you can see it through. The marathon is almost over. And we've been told after thousands of years of hard work, we have come to the point, the threshold, to cross the finish line into the Gula Hamitis Vashlema. So Tisha B'Av is part of the equation and a critical part of it. Yes, it reminds us of negative things, but it also makes us aware of them. And awareness is the way we heal. And that's why we remember it after all these years. So to get to a few questions that were asked, and though we have talked about this topic quite a few times, remember that we're already in episode 413. We're talking about the ninth year of My Life Because It Is Applied. So I've spoken about it, but it's always good to refresh. And in general, kol yem yir benecha chadashim, Torah is meant to be every day new. So even ideas that we may have discussed or learned or experienced, when it happens now, it happens in a new way. A new way of personalizing, a new way of applying it, etc. So that first question we addressed, what is the significance of Tisha B'Av being pushed off a day due to Shabbos? The significance is it gives us in full, gl- in full glare, full light, we see, we see the power and the inner power of what Tisha B'Av is. That's what Shabbos was about, because they have celebration. So it wasn't ignoring Tisha B'Av, it was seeing the, the deeper premiums, the inner part of it, as we explained. The next question, if the energy of a day is recreated each year on that day, why do we fast on the next day? So let's read it more in detail. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, we are taught that Jewish holidays not only commemorate events that happened long ago, but that every year the original energy of that holiday is available and manifest again. Correct. Like we say, Hayomim Ha'el and Neskarim V'nasim, that these all interprets, what means Neskarim V'nasim? You remember them, but they're recreated again. So that same energy, time is like a spiral. So we come back to that same point on a different uh, plane, but the same point as it was originally the first one. That's why birthdays are significant, Rosh Hashanah, every holiday. It's not just an event that happened back then. Even regular weekdays, Sunday, we start from day one, counting day one of the week, because the energy of chesed, of the original Sunday, is repeated on a different plane, but the same energy. So based on that, with that concept being said, why do we fast and mourn the day after Tisha B'Av when it falls on Shabbos, like this year? Being that the energy of Tisha B'Av, both the negative energy of the Churban and the positive energy of future redemption, would have man- been manifest the day before on Shabbos when it's actually the ninth of Av. Okay. Seems like a very obvious and uh, fundamental question. So obviously, it's not just about Tisha B'Av, it's any Nitche. We had it also the 17th of Tammuz. Or in general, anything that the Torah says is pushed off for whatever reason, you can apply the same um, question. So the answer is several fold here. First of all, the Torah itself is the one that tells us that the energy is repeated, is also telling us that when you push it off, you're pushing off that energy. That means that we don't push it off to the 12th of to the 11th of of or the 12th of of. It's pushed off a day later. That means the energy is still there the next day too. And indeed, when it comes to Tisha B'Av, we know this. We know that the fires were at their highest at the end of the ninth of Av and continued to burn through the tenth of Av, which is why we don't eat meat when Tisha B'Av is immediately over, because the destruction wasn't completely over. That's regarding Tisha B'Av. Regardless, that itself is part of the, the energy. And if you think about it psychologically, you think that just on Tisha B'Av there was sadness. You don't think the next day was sadness? Go back to the destruction. Of course. All the effects, seeing a Beis Amir is gone, of people going into exile, the loneliness that we described, how Yirmiyo describes, Echa Yoshva Badad. Whoa, alas, oh, how she sits alone. All that was felt not just on Tisha B'av, not just on the 10th either, even later. But the 10th of Av remains within the orbit. But even more importantly, is when we say a Nitche, we're not just saying you push it off. Remember, Shabbos replaces whatever sadness we would experience on Tisha B'Av, Shabbos replaces it with joy. So you're experiencing the positive as you accurately point out. But since the Beis HaMikdash was not rebuilt yet and Mashiach didn't come, we still need to have the sensitivity and that's why we fast. So though the energy technically, yes, is Tisha B'Av, but number one is Tisha B'Av also on the 10th of Av, except in most years you don't see that. In the Nidhi you see that. 
And it's also to bring out this, this element of these two sides of the coin, two aspects to what Tisha B'Av is about. So in many ways, on the 10th of Av, we have the birth of Mashiach and the Sikh of Tavshin Nun Aleph, 29 years ago. The Rebbe says yes, because we say, when the fast day we said Nachim, the Arizal says, why do you say Nachim and Mincha during Tisha B'Av? Because that's when Mashiach was born. But technically Mashiach was born already yesterday. But the energy has been now moved to Sunday as well. So on Shabbos, you have the positive side of it. And on, on Sunday, you have the positive, but also the, the, the sad side of it, which is that it hasn't happened yet, and we still mourn, and we still fast, and so on. And I would add one more thing. The energy of Tisha B'av is also includes the energy of Anitra. That's also energy. The fact that Tisha B'av, when it came out the first time, we knew that there'd be a calendar and there'd be time Shabbos would be Tisha B'av. So that's also part of the energy, that it should be pushed off. Now, pushed off technically, but also revealing that Tisha B'av also has a positive side on that very day. But the idea that you push it off in the words of the Gemara about Shavas Batam is Kivan de'itcha Once it's pushed off, let it be pushed off entirely. That's also part of the energy of Tisha B'av. So one final point about that, right? Next question. Why do we need the Holy Temple when we draw down the divine through our prayers? We are sad over the loss of the Beis Hamidish because with its loss, the presence of the Shekhinah left the world. Correct. V'shachanti b'seicham. God, dwell, I will dwell among you. The Beis Hamidish is not there. You don't have that in the physical sense. But we were also taught that when ten people dive together with a minion, the Shekhinah dwells among them. So why do we need a base of Middash if we can accomplish the same thing of having the Shekhinah dwell among us by davening with a minion, praying with a quorum? Let's just make sure we, we daven with a minion every day. And to make the strong question stronger, it also says that, the, that, the, that a shul, a synagogue, is a Migdash Mat. So it's not just the davening. We actually have a mini sanctuary, a Migdash Mat, a sanctuary in microcosm, which is every shul. So I think the answer is quite obvious. Though the purpose of the Beis HaMidus was v'shachante b'seicham, not that God should dwell in a, book of brick, in a building of bricks and mortar, or wood and bricks and stone, but that he should dwell among us, but he wanted it to be done through the channeling of a base actual physical mishkan or migdash, the temporary one during the time when they traveled through the wilderness, the mishkan, mishkan, but that includes Vasudhi the Migdash, the Besa Migdash. Because the full manifestation of it is when you also have it in a physical presence, literally in a physical building. So let's explain. A human being is not complete, it says, Ainodem Bale Bias, or Bale Karka, in order to build a bias on it. A person is not complete without a piece of land, without a home. Why not? We created a divine image. You have all your faculties, please God, healthy. Why do you need a home? But there's something about a home that makes us feel comfortable. A dira, Exodus explains in the Moshe of dira betachtenim, the example, that you feel completely comfortable there. Whereas when you walk in the street, there you have to have your defenses up. It's a hostile environment. You don't know where you are. A true home is a place where you can be completely vulnerable, completely expansive. And we see indeed that a human being, God forbid you see a homeless person, there's something missing. Rabbi Kiva Eger, in explaining this in his Svarim, Pesah Eitzel, in his, in his, talks about it, also says, isha. A person is not complete without a wife, without a spouse. Le'tevodam li'es levade. So it's a discussion, is a spouse and a home the same thing or two different elements? But either way, there's something not complete. That doesn't mean you can't be intact, but complemus. So though God can dwell and rest among us in our heart and soul, and that's the main thing, because you can, the point was not to dwell in the building, but when you also have that home, a place that you can say is mine, and we come and serve in that Beis Amidus, or the Kahanim serve on our behalf, that creates the channel that allows us to interface with God in the fullest sense of the word. That's why we want the goal. We don't just say, okay, you know what? We'll do, we'll be, do our service in God, serving God and God will dwell among us. 
we want a third temple, and want Yerushalayim, and you want Israel, you want a whole world, that the whole physical world will be a home for God. Not just your heart and soul will be a home. So those Shua Migdash Ma'at has a, has a taste of it. And Davening brings the Shekhinah. When you learn Teiri, you bring the Shekhinah, you bring the Divine Presence. When you're a good person, you bring the Divine It's all correct. But if good is good, is better, not better. Or put it even better, you can't really do it completely without that. As the Rambam says, chapter 11, Hilchas Malachim, that only when the Beis HaMidish will be here, we will be able to have all the mitzvahs. A lot of mitzvahs can be done. Why not? Why can't they just be done? Who says it has to be dependent on the Beis HaMidish? Because the Beis HaMidish is the ultimate channel that brings the Shekhinah down through that into the hearts and souls of each one of us. So those two, it says in the Maimarim, in a number of places, remember in Tav Shem Zayim, Parsha Truma, the Rebbe Koch a lot in it, that the, real, that, that the real purpose of the Beis HaMikdash is, is fulfilled now too, when it's in your heart and soul. But the Shlemus is when you'll have an actual building, which is why we grieve and mourn over the destruction. Because it means, so at the end of the day, it's just for me personally, number one, even if you have completely the Shekhinah within you, it's not complete until it's in the entire world, all of existence. And secondly, it can't be completely in you if it's only here and it's not in other people. Or in the world around us, there's still some compromise. To say, Aeneas Nafshi Salti, I've brought the godliness within me. As soon as godliness is not everywhere, then it's not completely anywhere. In a revealed way we're talking about. So that's the critical point why we, 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 we pray so often for the rebuilding of the Beis HaMikdash, which represents the whole Shekhinah back on earth as it was before the, before the Chet Eitz and, and, and so much more so, how it will be in a permanent way when Mashiach comes. And this answers the next question as well. Dear Rabbi Jacobson, why is the Beis HaMikdash such a central component to the Gula? Can you please explain the status of the times when the Beis HaMikdash was standing and why the Beis HaMikdash is such a central theme to Gula? When you learn the history of the two temples, it seems to be very far from the ideal world we are davening for, we are praying for. Centuries of wicked kings, idol worship, Kahanim G'daylim, high priests who bought the position for money, trouble with Stukim, etc., etc. Maybe it wasn't called Gulas, but neither does it sound very much like Gula. So when we are praying, should we focus on the Beis HaMikdash? If its presence in and of itself didn't seem to have that much of an effect on the nation? Or more in general, the coming of Mashiach, which I assume is what will make the era of the Beis HaMikdash different from the first two. So you have it right. We have two components here. There's the human being, which is of course the central component in the, fulfilling the purpose of existence. God created the world in six days. But first he set the stage. He set the table, as the Mishnah says in Sanhedrin. And then he brought his crown jewel, a special guest. You bring the guest, like the Mishnah says, why a human being was created last. You bring, first you set the table, then you bring your guest. So on one hand, the purpose is the human being who's the partner with God in creation to make a home and build a home out of this hostile material world and turn it to a spiritual environment that's a seamless fusion with the divine purpose for which it was created. Okay. But the call is not just for the person, it's also the transformation we live in a world. Like the chassidus, the language would be, not just your guf and nefesh abamis, not just your body and your animal soul, but also chelke be'elam, the part of the world you're in. And that's why we were given mitzvahs. Mitzvahs are not just your heart and soul. It's not just loving God, reverence for God, faith, amunah, learning Torah. Not only the mitzvahs, ben adam l'mokim. I mean the mitzvah shebelev, but also mitzvahs, physical mitzvahs. Tzitzis, tefillin. Mezuzah. Why? Because the goal is not just for the human being to serve God, but also to transform the very material existence. Now one with the other is not complete. There's the gavra, there's the chefza, there's the person, and there's the world around them. In addition to the chefza of our own very lives. And so we need both. And that's the answer. During the time of the Beis HaMikdash, or let's start with the Mishkan. So the purpose of the Mishkan was Rishachanti Besecha. And had they done it right, and there wouldn't have been a Chet Egel, depending on the opinion whether the Chet Egel came before or after. But regardless, they would have done it right. 
they would have gone into Eitz Yisrael with Moshe, and it would have been Mashiach's times. It would have been, because it says that Moshe went into Eitz Yisrael, the Beis Midrash, the Mishkan, and the Beis Midrash would never be able to be destroyed. Ma'isi de Moshe Nitzchim. As is brought in Sephardim, Chassidus, some Chassidic sites that the Rebbe brings it quite often. But it didn't work out. So the goal was to have a Mishkan, and the people would be aligned, and the structure would be aligned, and the world would be aligned. But that didn't happen. So then they had another chance. First a different Mishkan, Mishkan Shila, a different Mishkan here and there, until finally building the Bes Amigdash in its place on the Harabayis in Yerushalayim. First the first temple, and they had a chance. It stood 410 years, but that didn't work. On both ends, the people were not the way they should be, as you describe, which in effect ultimately affected the way the Shekhinah, the divine, rested in the structure as well. And if there's a compromise in the people, there's going to be a compromise in the service in the temple. Whether it's corruption or other things that happen. So came the second temple, a second chance. That God covered by Sa'achim and Arishin, which was even greater, both in years and in size, 420 years. Again a chance. And that was destroyed due to sinas chinam, baseless hatred. Then came the long Golis, which was almost 1950 years or 1954 years, I believe, since the Second Temple was destroyed, to give us the opportunity to now do it right. Do it right from the bottom up. First fix, build a Mishkin within yourself. Then build it an extension into your shuls and your synagogues and your schools and your yeshivas and bate midrashas and bate kunsiyas. And then by extension, your communities, in your cities, in your states, in your countries, Transform the world into a dira b'tachtenim. Through what? Through teira mitzvahs. To bring in godliness everywhere we can. Teira mitzvahs. Tzedek v'yesha. Justice. Virtue. Not just to Jews, but also to non-Jews through the Sheva Mitzvahs B'nei Neach, the universal code, moral code that was given at Sinai. And you have the power to do so. Transform the world. And make it the right keli. And then comes the Beis Amidah Shashlishi. And this time it will be permanent because of the work that was done from the bottom up, true refinement from within. At the end of the day, the first base of and the second, and definitely the Mishkin was more a gili mulmail, it came from above. The people definitely contributed to it, and they were part of it, and they brought the gold, silver, and copper. But a full, a full infusion, a full perme- permeating existence is through the hard work, and the suffering, and the challenges, and the blood, sweat, and tears that were shed in Golos. And that's a transformation from within. So we have much to learn. We learn about the beautiful things of the Beis HaMikdash, but we also know that people messed up, as you said accurately. So it's not just we look at it and say, oh, we only remember the rosy part. No, we know why it was destroyed. But now we want to have to learn the best, to learn the lessons, what not to do, and also what to do. And every generation that doesn't rebuild the Beis HaMikdash is as if they destroyed it. Okay. Which leads me straight, good segue to the next piece. I didn't even realize. <laughs> Dear Rabbi Jacobson, after all the work that great men and women did over the generations, how can our sages say that a generation that didn't rebuild the temple is considered as if it destroyed it? It says that in every generation the basic is not rebuilt, it's as if that generation is responsible for destroying it. Could there... For someone tried to say the Alter Rebbe, the Tzemach Tzedek, and all our Rebbeim were failures, and it's as if they destroyed the Beis Amigdash. I see it differently. I think although Mashiach may not have come during the Friedrich Rebbe's leadership, for example, not only do I, not only do I feel that he did, he did not destroy the Beis Amigdash, but I feel that he and the other Rebbeim rebuilt part of it with their Aveda, and we just have to put the final touches on it to complete the job. As in, the teachings we are, as, as in the teachings that we are standing on the shoulders of giants. We have already polished the buttons. All we have to do now that the structure of the base of Midas is complete is to put the mezuzah on the door, turn the key and open the door and go inside and enjoy seeing Hashem's presence revealed in our physical world. So since we are standing on the shoulders of giants, who did most of the hard work in previous generations? So how could Chazal make such... Excuse me. How could Chazal make such a degrading and false statement that generations that didn't rebuild the base of Midrash, it's as if they destroyed it? Well, you can disagree as much as you like, but this is a, this is a Gemara, and this is what Chazal say. 
And uh, if, you, if you need this, not that we need it, but the Rebbe quoted it more than once. I remember once very passionately, it's out there on a video. And it's referring to everybody. It doesn't say exceptions, the Alta Rebbe, the Mitla Rebbe, Tzamech Tzedek, and so on. So it's a fair question. You could say, so what they did didn't do anything. Of course what they did did accomplish things. But at the end of the day, the finish line is the key. Avram Yitzhak Yankov and all the generations to Moshe Rabbeinu did great things too, but Moshe was the one that finished the Deir Ashvi and brought the Shechina below and building the Mishkan. And as the Rebbe says, that's our job, the seventh generation, to finish the work. Now it's built on the previous generations. Like you said, Nidget standing on shoulders of giants, for sure. The Gemara is not saying that, that the tzaddikim of generations, including our Rebbeim, didn't accomplish anything. Chaz v'shalom. It's saying, however, as long as there's no Beis Amigdash, it's as if we destroyed it because we still did not do what had to be done to finish the job. And the Alter Rebbe, I'm sure the older Rebbeim, would be the first to tell you that. It's not about failure, it's about what the re- accomplishment is ultimately. Now they did much to lead us to that point, as you described accurately and as the Rebbe explains. So it's not a contradiction that a great Aveda that people did. And we're not just talking about the Rabbi, you're going back all the way to the t- times of Shas, Tanoim, Amaroim, Sadikim, Amish, the highest level people. So they all did plenty. And accumulatively, it's like building blocks that will lead to the Gula. But the Gemara, the Gemara still says what it says. Why? Because having the Shechina below is the key. And as, as, and as long as you did not accomplish of bringing godliness in a revealed way, in a complete way, you're still part of the destruction of it. Because we haven't done the complete job. Now whether the Sadiqin themselves didn't finish their work, or they didn't do the work that they had to lead their people, that's another discussion. We say why the Arizal says al so the Rabchav writes, he didn't have any sins because it was because he's a Neshama Klaus, he includes the sins of the generation. Or he has something subtle. Or bottom line, the captain of the ship, like Moshe, didn't go into Eretz Yisrael because his people didn't go in. So even the Tzadik is not complete until there's the Geula, the Beis Hamidosh. So it's not necessarily his lack of personal Aveda, but he's also responsible for his generation. So that's why it's not a contradiction. And on the contrary, as I pointed out, the statement is not meant to be a critique. It's meant to be a responsibility. That every generation has the power to rebuild the base of Amigdash. That's the base punchline. It's not here about blaming and pointing fingers. And every generation will look at the other generation and say, no, you're at fault, you're at fault. That's not the point. The point is the opposite. The responsibility that, that we carry and the ability. We have the capacity to accomplish it. And how? Because just as sin as chinam destroyed it then, so as long as there isn't a complete avas chinam among us, so all of us are somewhat culpable in the continuation, the preparation, is a pool in the as the Raga Javar explains. So since it's, a, it's a, an ongoing perpetual thing, so whatever stopping stopped the Besamidish from being rebuilt is continuing to stop it until we do something about it. And you'll say, you did everything? Well, first of all, is that correct? Did we do everything? But still, we are a collective. We're all responsible for each other, and we need to do it together and ultimately bring the Gu'ula. Okay. How exactly does learning about the Beis Midrash cause it to be recreated? If someone learns the part of Tanakh where Shimshon Agibah smashes down the Philistine temple, will the Philistine temple be recreated? So I hope your question is more tongue-in-cheek than actual it doesn't say everything you learn in Teda is recreated. You learn about a, a Russia, and therefore you recreate the Russia. Teda is Teda Semes, Teda Chesed. It's the godliness within everything. If you learn about Shimshon Agib, bringing down the Philistine temple, so that's what you do. It allows you to bring down all Philistine temples, all temples of idolatry and everything that defies God. That's how you're supposed to understand it. If you learn about the Beis Amidosh, which is a positive thing, bringing godliness in this world, so kola esig betayda se'ela, the Gemara says. Everyone who studies about a carbon, it's as if the Teira considers as if he brought it. Why? Because the Teira is the blueprint for creation. The Teira is not just a book to telling you about creation. It's actually the blueprint. Even God himself. Why does it say, Vayyemer alikim yihir er, vayyir er? Why doesn't it just say, Vayyivra alikim er? Because it says, the Medjah says, the Zayr explains, this talk about Isa, about Alma. God first created a blueprint. 
his plan, his vision for existence. Like an architect creates a blueprint, like the Medrash says right in the beginning of Bereshit Rabbah, Pisraois or Pinkasois. Creates a blueprint. So the first thing Hashem, then he looks and says, Vayyemer Alekim, he read his blueprint. It says, Yehi Oyer, okay, now I create Oyer. The architect uses his own blueprint by which he creates. So in effect, when you're learning Torah, so the, 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 the Zayar continues. It's talk about Isa about Alma. God looked into Teda and created the world. Kach, Banash, or Kach Yisrael. Same thing with human beings. When they learn the Teda, they makayim the world. They preserve and they perpetuate their existence. Because when we look in Teda, the Teda is telling us how the world should be used for its purpose. So it's more than just a book. That's a description. It's actually a blueprint. And more than a blueprint, it's the very energy of creation. So in that sense, when we learn about something, the thing we're learning about, that alone is part of the process of creating it. That's why when you call it, if you learn about something negative, you don't create the negative, you actually create the elimination of the negative. That's the same point. But remember, that doesn't mean that we suffice with just learning. The learning is meant to be it's meant to be the first step. The next step is actually creating and actually bringing down the base of English in actuality. Okay. So sadly, sadly, well, fitting to sad days, but we wish it didn't happen. New attacks in Eretz Yisrael. So someone writes, literally just, just came in this question, right? Uh, right uh, on, sort of on, on the 10th of Av. I live in Sidarot, Israel, which is very close to the Gaza border. Again, we are dealing with rocket attacks coming from Gaza to civilian home, homes. All day and night are loud warning sirens, and we, we are running into underground shelters. When will there ever be peace and calm? The Torah promises us that the eyes of God are always upon the land to protect it. Even if, one, if even one missile makes it out of Gaza across the border into Israel, then God has not done his job, and he's essentially, I don't want to use the word this person writes here, but he's essentially not, didn't tell us the truth. He said he's protecting us. In the past two days, over 350 missiles come, are coming at us. So this week, is God not telling the truth 350 times? And if God is, that, is, is not telling the truth, then is also the Torah not telling us the truth? said the person writing writes a much harsher word. I'm just not using it out of respect. Enough is enough. Do your job properly, God, and protect the innocent people in Israel from this terror like you promised to, to us. <laughs> or you should be fired from your job. Okay, well, uh, we're not in the position of firing God. It, it works the other way around, frankly. We need God. So I wouldn't go ahead and just throw out loosely such lines. Look, the big question why God allows good people to suffer and bad things to happen to good people. And in this case, allowing the Holy Land, the Promised Land, the protected land of Israel to be defiled, to be attacked. I don't have an answer to this question, neither do you, neither does anyone. This is the biggest question of all of history. So if you ask them that question, the answer has to be is we are not God and we don't know. And if God wanted us to know, he would tell us. The question we have to ask is, what are we going to do about it? Just to sit and just complain and say, God, you're not doing your job, is that fine? At Sadiqim have done that, and, and, and I'm sure someone who's under attack has a right, as a child, you can cry out to God and say, God, have Rahmanus, do your job, by all means. But that can't be the end of the story. God hears your prayers, and God sees as well. And he wants us to pray, and wants us to ask. The question is, what are we doing? That's how we have to ask ourselves the question. What are we doing? To say that there's already over 1900 years in Golos, Vifl Zashir, Ad Mosai, the Rebbe would cry out with tears, sobbing, weeping. And yet at the same time, the Rebbe went ahead and did whatever he could to fight the Golos, to initiate programs, to send out Shluchim, to bring light everywhere we can bring light to the world. While we also say that, Tasha. So the question we have to ask is, what are we doing? That's not to blame ourselves. Yes, we already deserved the goal of more, more, it's already overdue long ago. 
as the Rebbe said, kolo kolo kitsin. All the deadlines were met. And even that we've done shuva too. And how much can we... But we're still here. And God still is the God. So we have to do what we have to do. We can't give up. And we can't just complain and, 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 uh, and be angry. That's the approach to it. So I don't have an answer. My heart is, my heart is pained as, as yours is every time there's an attack, every time you see in general a tragedy. And there's more, unfortunately, there are things happening that are not pleasant and they're not good. And people, deaths, illnesses, other challenges that people are going through. But we've been trained to be soldiers. And I'm not Paulie, your mama, or not. We were trained to bring light to the world, to bring, we are day workers. So, yes, there's a time when we cry out and we pray and we say what we have to say. That's part of what Tisha B'Av is all about. But also, we, make a, we also come out with a strong resolve and a statement an unwavering commitment to goodness and to light, and we will continue to forge ahead and continue to fight for what is right. And even when we don't always see Hashem doing it with our eyes, even though there's definitely deeper good in it, we still continue to forge ahead. I remember once at the Fabringen, where the Rebbe quoted the Medrash. The Gemara, it's also based on the Pasuk and Echa. So right in the beginning it says, Echa Yosheva Bodad, how she sits alone. A city that was filled with people is now like a widow. Ke'almana. And Rashi brings from the Gemara that Ke'almana only like a widow. Because not actual widow, because like a husband who went off on a journey. So the widow, so the, the wife is left abandoned. And she can't remarry. But it's not an actual widow, he didn't die. So God went off into Galus, Shinta Begalusa. So like a widow. And the Medrash continues and says that when Mashiach will come and Hashem will see that the Jewish people, his wife, waited. The husband will see that after all these years he waited. She didn't go ahead and give up on him. She didn't remarry. She continued to pray that her husband reunite with her in the Beis Amid, the Shashlishi, in the Gula. And that will like be a shock. Oh, awesome. That a wife should wait over 1900 years and not give up. Just think about what does that mean? And I remember the Rebbe saying it. God, in a way, abandoned us, at least on a revealed level. And the wife has all the reason to say, hey, you know what, you left me? Fine. We were at fault for what we had to do, but it's many years. So in a way, we were even more committed on a revealed level to God than we see God committed to us. Kav Yochum. You can't say that because the fact that we're alive and the Jewish people have survived despite all odds. So obviously God was there to protect us. But not always in a revealed way. We saw things, horrible things. Where was God in all that darkness that we experienced through the years? And still we maintain some spark. The pilot flame is still burning. That will, you can say, I'm saying this is my own word, blow God away. Of course, God is not going to be blown away by anything, but still on a Giluim level, such a thing, such a commitment. When we say, we say to God, that when you conceal yourself and when we suffer, why are you allowing the Goyim, the, the, the enemies, to cry, where's your God? And yet we continue to hold on. We are witnesses and we continue and we sit another Tisha B'Av, another Asar of and sit on low stools and dim lights and grieve and remember and cry out and we teach it to our children. There's something about that that is impossible to fathom, but also a tremendous indestructible power that nothing can extinguish that hope. And even if some people sometimes waver and some people have questions, there's always a Jew somewhere with hope and usually more than one. And even those that have questions also have moments. We all have our ups and downs, and it can be understood. We're human beings after all. But when you see the few people that hold on no matter what, I mean, it's unbelievably inspiring. I remember once going to Shul and Tisha Years ago, I was a young, uh, young Shemendrik. I was like maybe 14, 15. I remember it was by Minchen. Of course, we put on film on Tisha B'Av then. And I saw an old Jew. I knew his by face. I remember his name. I remember him all the years, but he was now wrinkled, probably, I, I, you know, as a young guy, probably even in his, in his 80s. 
And I saw him putting on film with that diligence. And I saw the anguish. He came from Russia. He had gone through the Holocaust. And I said to myself, unbelievable. He's a Jew. And one among millions. He's putting on this film, remembering Tishabov. You can see in his face all the pain and anguish, but the pile of flame is still burning. That's how we look at it. And that is impossible to extinguish. Because it's not like everything was always rosy and nice. So that's one thing. We went through the darkest and still carry the hope, carry the flame. That's the point. That's the point. So as saddened as we are by these attacks, we continue to believe that God is watching at Yisrael and will continue to watch. And the Rebbe never stopped by saying that it was always the safest place on earth, even when there were attacks, even during the Six-Day War, even when everyone else said is danger. And you know what? Here we are. It just saw as a strong country, has more Jews today than any other part of the world, continues to thrive. Many, many, many brachas. This doesn't justify even one missile attack. But let's not put, forget the context. We, were, we are not here 80 years ago at the mercy of the Nazis, or the Bolsheviks and the communists. Today we have so much that we have capable of doing even just this, being able to sit together and fabring and talk and increase in terimits, increase in light. No one's stopping you and me from doing what we have to do to rebuild the Beis Amidah Shashlishi. There was a time when we were stopped, when we were forbidden, when we were arrested, when we were killed, we were excommunicated, we were expelled, etc., etc. But now we have that capacity. So let's from that move to as we move from Tisha B'Av and the 10th of Av to the 15th of Av. As I said, the conclusion, the end of Mesech the Tainis. Mesech the Tainis, the tractate that deals with fasting and Tisha B'Av and other sad days. How does it conclude? That there were no holidays as great as the 15th of Av. That's the logical conclusion. Yom Kippur, even though, as I mentioned before, it's also hinted to as well, because it's Yom Chasenos is at Matan and that comes as a result of the Cheta Egel, which is the cause of Shiva Sabatamas and ultimately also the cause of the, the, the destruction. But in the most revealed way, the 15th of Av is coming right after Tisha B'Av. So though the Gemara brings a bunch of reasons of why 15th of Av is such a holiday, but that is explains what's the root of all the reasons. The root of the reasons, because it comes after Tisha B'av, after the tremendous Yerida and Pagam and injury and wound in Malchus, in the Jewish people, and namely in the, in the connection between God, heaven and earth, and God and existence, through the destruction of the temple, what comes, the Aliyah that comes after that, the full moon, Kaima Sireh Bashlamusa, Yichud Shimshu Vesireh, the union between the Mashpia and the Makabal, between the divine and the recipient, between Zah and Malchus in the language of Chassidus, is of its greatest level. So even though 15th of Nisan is a great day, the day of the Exodus from Egypt, Pesach, Yitzis, Mitzrayim, 15th of, of Tishrei is Sukkot, 15th of, 14th and 15th of others, Purim and Shushan Purim. But there's nothing like Tuba of because that moon is a very different moon. came after the moon was so hurt and so injured in the 9th of Av. And as we explained, from the darkness comes the greatest light. You read the Tzayr Chaldea, the Rebbe Rashab has a beautiful maimon on this. Famous maimon, Nachmu Eter, that the Rebbe reprinted in a special kuntis. And it's learned, talks strength is strong about this point. Also, Chamish Rasabov, and the Rebbe Chazad, I think, many, many times during the Fabreng, is that he Fabreng on the 15th of Av. So someone asked this question. If the Talmud says when the month of Av enters, we diminish in Simcha, why are there big celebrations on the 15th of Av? The Talmud didn't say when the first two weeks of Av enter, we diminish in joy. The month of Av is 30 days long. A great question, but it's a question of the Talmud on the Talmud. We didn't create the 15th of Av. The same Talmud, the same Gemara, not the same line, but I mean the same Talmud, the same body of Talmud, that says, Mishanichnis Av, Mamayitim Besimcha, says, So, think, could it be a contradiction? The answer is, like we said, because even the diminishment of joy and of is not just a dead end. It's not just sadness. 
it's a sadness to bring a greater simcha. Indeed, that explains also the Mincha Saloza, the Munkat Shurtaitz is Mishanich Nesov. When Ov enters, Mamayatin, we diminish the matters of Ov through Bisimcha, with joy. How could he say that? It's a seemingly exact opposite interpretation of the Pshat. So he's not coming, God forbid, to say that, no, the Gemara says, diminish in joy. I'm telling you to increase in joy. He's saying, because the diminishment that the Gemara is talking about is in order to increase in a way that halacha allows us to increase. Pekud Hashem Yishar Mesam Chelev, learning Teda, doing mitzvahs. Tzim ba mishpet tepada v'shavah b'tzdoke. As we said in the yesterday. In other words, find ways. Because the real purpose of the diminishment is not diminishment. Once you know that, then tuba of, it, of course, as Tisha B'Av ends, now starts being revealed the positive energy within it all. Second point you have to keep in mind is that the month of Av, even though there's a Tuba Av, it's not like we forget the sad events that happened. So even though technically after nine days are over, after Tisha B'Av, it doesn't say anywhere that you have to continue to mourn or grieve. You could have weddings and simchas. So you have to say, so what does it mean, Mishnah Nichon Sov Mamayitim B'Simcha? When it comes to other, we say the whole month of other. We don't just say when Purim ends, we no longer increase in joy. We continue to increase. So you have to say that the Pshat is, like I said, that the increasing of the sadness after Tisha B'Av is in the form of Simcha. When it comes to other, Simcha is a, is a positive. It's a revelation already, so you only increase in revelation. Here, the second half of the month, is the the the, the mamayatin, is through this the joy that we do. Now, logically, I don't think that there are any limitations of what kind of joy you can celebrate the second half of Av. So you have to say pshat is something like what I just said. And if someone has a better pshat or a different way or, or svarim talk about it, it's an interesting subject to address. Another question a person asks is: Two above the Jewish Valentine's Day, and how is it to be celebrated today? Some call it the Sadie Hawkins Day, but Lahavdil Lelf Avdalis, obviously, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say anything. If anything, they copy us, we're not copying them. But it does say, it says in the Mishnah clearly, that on this day, that Bnei Shalayim, Bnei Tzian, the daughters of Zion in Jerusalem, would go out and they would, um, they, and, and essentially, it was a Shidduch day. They would say, Young man, raise your eyes. And they would, Show off their uh, wares, so to speak. When I say that, I mean that obviously in a tzniyazdik, a modest way. The Gemara talks about their beauty, but all obviously in a modest way. And in that sense, it was a day of shidduchim. So, I don't know if anybody made it in Tamini saw that this is a day of shidduchim, but it's definitely a zgula. Now, what's the connection? Because remember, yem chasen nasi ze matan teira. Yem sim chaslibe ze beis amigdash. That's what the, 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 the Posik in Shir Hashirim that the Mishnah learns from, that there's no holidays like Tir Chamisha Asabav and Yem Kippur. Yem Kippur is Yem Chasen Nasei because that's when they received the second tablets. Moshe Rabbeinu received the second tablets, which was the conclusion of the marriage that happened by Matan Teda. The Churban Beis Amigdash is like a destruction between the marriage between heaven and earth, between the Beis Amigdash, between the divine presence and existence. So Tuba, which is a Tikkun, how does it manifest? In the Yem Chasen that they connect again. And in specifically that the human being created, Zohar Nekeva, male and female, the divine image, the goal is that they should unite in a sacred way and marry. So Tuba is celebrated in that fashion. It's the idea of reconnecting after there was a disconnect. You don't get married during the nine days for that reason, because... When there's a time, it's a somber time, where there's a disconnect between heaven and earth. The chasana was in some way affected between the husband and the wife, God and the Jewish people. So we also honor that in our personal lives. But Tuba of, that's when we start celebrating the Yichud, Shim Shevesira, Mashpia Makabal, Zah Malchus, which essentially manifests and evolves on the human level between a chasana and a kala. So, is it celebrated today? I think some people use it as an opportunity to say it's a Yem's Gula. I remember thinking Tov Shalom at Hay, 1975, just as a word from Shemisha Sabah, which I should mention, 
The Rebbe then said, Bochus son Necha. He says, from this we learn two things. That up to that point, the Bochus shouldn't be looking. What's he looking at women for? He shouldn't be looking. He should be involved in learning Teda. But when he comes of age, then he has to look. Because uh, you have to find the person that you... In the, so that's why it says, son Necha. So both things we know from this. That before the time, you don't have to look. And then when you do, you have to look. And then do what one has to do to get married. And do the Ishtadlus and effort. And build binyan binyan adayad, abayis them and be yisrael, and make a dira betachtenim in your home, and then by extension in the world around us. So one question, one more question before we go to Nachamu, which is what is the meaning of the verse "Tziim b'mishpat tepada v'shaver b'tzdaka"? One minute. Can you please explain and give some intuition into the Pasuk Simishbet Vashavab Zdaka? Thank you. Yeah, just looking at the exact language. I like to read exactly. Yeah. So, this is the end of the verse, the end of the Haftara that we said yesterday, the end of the chapter in the, the beginning of Yeshaya Hanavi, where Chazen Yeshayo, the vision of destruction, but as we also know, it's the vision of rebuilding the Besamidah. So, the end concludes like we've been saying. It's not just about the negative, it's that ultimately Tzim B'mishpet the Zion will be redeemed. B'mishpet, through law, through Torah, especially Halach of Torah, and V'shavah B'zdaka, and its captives will be redeemed through charity. So the simple interpretation is that's the conclusion, that after everything is said and done, the negative is not just to make us sad, it's to tell us, to, be, to, to motivate us to do something to repair it, and we repair it through Teir and Zdoka, the two main pillars, of course, through davening as well. But on a deeper level, remember, Tzian is referring to Yerushalayim, Tzian. Exodus explains why it's called Tzian, a sign. So it's also the remedy, the antidote, to all forms of destruction. Why? Because the, the Beis Amidah's destruction, as I mentioned, was a split, a schism, between heaven and earth. How do you correct that? By aligning yourself to heaven, to godliness. How do you do that? So Hashem gave us three pillars. Teira, Vedic, Mils, Chasad. So in general, Mishpat and Zdok include both, or include all three. Sometimes it says these two include also the Tefillah. And what does that mean? That by learning Teira, you align your mind, your cognitive conditioning to godliness, to think like God thinks. To understand as God understands. That's the Torah. Like we said before, you hear it, you look in the blueprint, and you align yourself with the blueprint God created. And through that, you preserve and you perpetuate the world. And Zdok is you follow God's behavior. Mahu Chanun Afata Chanun. As He is kind, you are kind. Mahu Rachum Afata Rachum. As He gives, as He's compassionate, you're compassionate. So you follow in His ways. As we align ourselves to godliness, that's how you rebuild the Beis Amidus. That's the brief, simple answer. And of course, in Chassidus talks a lot about Tzion and Mishpat, all these words. There's my modem Tzion by Mishpat Tepa, the Tov Shin Lamed Hey, the Rebbe said, my modem on this verse. There's my modem in, uh, in, in other places from the Rabbeim, all the way back from the Alta Rebbe. There's plenty of Chassidus on this Psukim if you want to learn more about it. Okay. Let's see here. What is the significance of Shabbos Nachmu? So Nachmu, of course, is the first of the seven weeks of consolation and comfort. And the significance is very straightforward. Nachmu, Nachmu, Ami. It's a double Nachama, because it's not just a Nachama, okay, you were sad and now be comforted. It's a comfort that also transforms the saddening. Like the Gemara, the end of Makkah, talks about Rabbi Akiva, that when he looked at the Harabais, the others cried because they saw desolation. And he cried... And he laughed because he saw the second half. He saw it through like we discussed before. Desolation is not the end of the story. If it was desolate, then it will also be fulfilled the second half of the prophecy that it will be rebuilt. And they responded to him, Akiva Nechamtoni, Akiva Nechamtoni, double Nechamtoni, like Nachamu Nachamu. So comfort, true comfort is not just moving away from the bad, but actually seeing how the negative really is transformed. You see the positive within the negative. That's briefly the point of Shabbos Nachamu. 
And with that begins a journey, a seven-week journey, as the Avodraham explains from Medrash, of a conversation of how this Nechama continues to grow week after week after week. I'll be giving some classes on this topic uh, through this period for more details. Now there's more questions on, on Vashanon. I, I just, time is limited, so I just want to do one more question. A lot of follow-up I never ended up doing really properly. Okay. What do we do when our rabbis and role models let us down? Dear Rabbi Jacobson, in my shul, the rabbi once taught us a story when Rabbi Zusha and Rabbi Elimelech were in jail and were upset they couldn't daven because there was a, cham- was because there was a chamber pot in the cell. They couldn't make a blessing, they couldn't daven. Until they realized that the same Torah that says we must daven also says not to daven in the vicinity of, bath- in the vicinity of bathroom waste. So by not davening in that situation, they were doing a mitzvah. A few months ago, the rabbi's mother passed away, my rabbi's mother in our synagogue, sadly, and he, was, and, he had to say, and he has to say Kaddish every day. Once in a while, we don't have a minion during the weekdays, and when we don't have a minion, he gets very upset and has a temper tantrum because he's not able to say Kaddish. I went over to him during the, his tantrum and tried to calm him down by saying the same Torah that says to say Kaddish with a minion also has not to say Kaddish when there isn't a minion. So by not saying Kaddish in that situation, you get a mitzvah, so you shouldn't, get, shouldn't be upset. Instead of being comforted by my words, he went into a deeper rage and started yelling at me. My question is, how can I take this rabbi seriously anymore when he clearly doesn't practice what he preaches? What do we do when our rabbis and role models let us down? Okay, well, your story is mild compared to some of the nightmares that I hear often when people talk about their rabbis and role models. But regardless, it's a good question, and I decided to answer it because it's also relevant to our times. Because like we said, those that don't rebuild the base of minutes is as if they destroyed it. And it says, Kivin de Shaske Rabbonon, because the Rabbonon, the rabbis, were quiet. That's, that meant that they, get, they agreed, and therefore they are culpable also in the sins of the generation. Um, well, it's one of the saddest things to see that, because it's one thing when the person is not a role model, is not a rabbi. But a person who's supposed to be a role model is what we look up to, especially young people, impressionable, or someone that you think is a hero, someone that's a role model, behaves in the wrong way. It can create tremendous damage. Nothing is irreversible, but, but it can create tremendous chil Hashem, and we see it all the time. So it's very sad to hear. At the same time, in this story, the story that you tell, look, people are human beings are human beings. It's easy to tell people the story of Rab Zush and Rabbi Lamelech. When it comes to yourself, you don't always live up to it. So I think you can be a little sensitive. I'm not agreeing with the rabbi. He should have taken what you said to heart. But you know, it could be he's very vulnerable. He's fragile. He lost his, uh, he said he lost his um, mother. So I would be a little gentle with him, just like one deserves to be with anyone. That's still, the, again, but still to answer the question about uh, rabbis and role models, I have to say is this. It says in the Gemara, Tzdok Osh HaKadosh Baruch Hu Yisrael Shepizon Lebena Umis. God did charity with the Jewish people that he spread them among the nations. So the obvious question is, one second. Spreading among the nations has been Pnei Chateinu Galinu Me'atzeinu. That due to our sins. Since when is that a virtue? Why is that a Tzdok? So Chassidus explains, because Pizon Bena Umis means to go around the world and elevate the sparks so meaning to elevate the sparks everywhere in the world. But what does it mean practically? So one of the explanations, Balabatasha, practical explanations, is because when the Jews were in a high level, like a Moshe Rabbeinu level, so a Sanhedrin, which was a holy court of law, a holy supreme court, you could trust them. But once there was Yerushalayim was compromised, especially Angolus, so it's actually a blessing, a tzedakah, that every community built its own bezdin, built its own so-called hierarchy. Because if even if one is a little corrupt, there's another one. This doesn't mean we have to run from one to the next, but it just preserves. Because imagine if you had one central court that was corrupt. They say when, ben- when Israel became a state, so when one of the religious party members said to Ben-Gurion, why don't we now reestablish a Sanhedrin? Supreme Court of Law. A central court. So Ben-Gurion, of all people, said, because it's hard to find someone that's not Oyev Betza. 
It's hard to find someone who's not going to be bribe, biased or, or someone you can't bribe. So, the, so with a smile, the, 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 the religious party member said, for money you can find anything. Even someone that... <laughs> for money you can find even someone that won't take a bribe. Okay. The point is, when you're not living in a perfect world, there's a tzedakah that there's a certain decentralization. How do we apply it to our discussion? I don't, I don't mean to compare it to a very physical example, but if the food isn't good in one place and it's really disturbing you, and you should discuss it with someone, because sometimes it's something you have to work through. No rabbi is going to be perfect. But if it is indeed disturbing, then it could be that you need to go to a different synagogue and find a different rabbi. I know some rabbis may not like that, but that's, that's a practical thing. We live in a free world and you can do that. But be careful that it shouldn't just be because you're sensitive and you're, begr- and you're, you're begrudging and so on. You want to make sure it's for the right reasons. So that's what we have, and that's why I always tell people, go to a shul and try out the shul. He says, which shul should I go to? I say, go to the shuls and see what it's like. If you have a good experience, then of course go back. If it's not great, try another shul. That's the best approach that I could take to these type of things. And obviously find someone that you ultimately, it's good to find someone you could trust. Because trust is as vital as Torah itself. Because if you don't trust the person who's teaching the Torah, the Torah they're going to teach you is not going to be trusted either. That's why it's such a critical piece. And I'm sure we'll talk about this some more as well. But I want to conclude with that, because it's somewhat of a negative, but there are many beautiful people out there. Nobody's perfect, but there are many beautiful people who are trying and that are role models and good to look up to. So with that, let's conclude this program. This is My Life is this Applied Special Tishabal program. May we go straight from this end of the 10th of Av into the Gula Amitiz Vashlema. Yehov Chiyom Meil Asosno Simcha Lemoyedim Tevim. And Tuba Av should actually be the greatest of holiday in the most revealed way because we'll be in Yerushalayim with Mashiach, with the Third Temple, permanently with all our loved ones. The Gula Amitiz Vashlema. This has been My Life Chassidus Applied. We're here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. Call two of everyone. And again, This program is brought to you by My Life, Chassidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidusapplied.com slash donate.